All right, deep divers, ready to jump into the world of Spanish e-commerce. We're talking about really getting a feel for what makes this market tick. It's more than just translating a website. Let's dig in. We're using this white paper as our guide. It's called the Practical Guide to Electronic Commerce for SMEs, and it's from AECM, the Spanish Association of E-Commerce and Relationship Marketing. You with me so far? Sounds good. Now, I know it's from 2008, but stick with me here. Think of it this way. Even though the internet moves fast, the fundamentals of how people shop online haven't really changed that much. Right. So even back then, Spain was seeing this huge boom in e-commerce. They had something like 9 million frequent online shoppers in 2008. Which sounds impressive, and it yeah. is. But then you look at the U.S., which was already pulling in $175 billion in sales that same year. Wow. Okay. Big difference. So what was going on there? Were Americans just way more into online shopping back then? Well, it's not quite that simple. The white paper actually points out a really interesting difference in government policies. Like what? Tax breaks. The U.S. was offering some pretty sweet incentives for online businesses back then, which Spain hadn't really caught on to yet. Interesting. So right off the bat, we're seeing how something like government policy can have a real impact. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about what people were actually buying back then. The white paper mentions electronics were big, right? Yeah, they were popular, but the profit margins were slim. The real success stories were those online outlets and flash sales sites. Oh, right. Like Bivip. Exactly. They popped up and tapped into that whole fear of missing out thing. Yeah, those limited time offers get you every time. But here's something I found interesting. The white paper says that over 60% of online shoppers in Spain still preferred businesses with a physical store. That's huge. What do you think is going on there? I don't know. Maybe it's about trust. Like if you know a business has a physical store, it feels more legit. You're spot on. Back then, online shopping was still pretty new for a lot of people. So that sense of security that comes with a physical location was a big deal. It makes sense when you put it like that. So even though everything was moving online, those traditional businesses still had a leg up. For sure. They had that built-in trust factor that online-only businesses had to work a lot harder to earn. Okay, so let's shift gears a bit and talk about online services. One thing that really stood out in the white paper was the ticketing market in Spain. Apparently, it was a pretty big deal. Huge. And it's got this really interesting B2B2C model going on mm. where you've got the customer buying the ticket and then the venue or promoter on the other side using the platform to sell those tickets. Right. So it's like a two for one customer relationship. Exactly. And the white paper specifically mentions Cervicaixa and El Corte Inglés as major players in this market. Those are some big names. I'm guessing brand recognition played a role in their success, but was there something more strategic going on? I mean, they're both such established brands. I bet that gave them a head start. For sure. But they were also really smart about using ticketing to drive traffic to their other businesses. Oh, I see what you mean. Like someone buys a concert ticket through El Corte Inglés, yeah. and then next thing you know, they're browsing for clothes or whatever else they sell. Yeah. Exactly. It's all connected. And don't forget about the technical side of things. Online ticketing is no walk in the park. What do you mean? Well, the white paper compares it to selling airline tickets. You've got to manage inventory in real time, deal with seating charts, and handle those massive spikes in demand when a popular event goes on sale. Sounds like a logistical nightmare. It can be. So you've got the convenience factor for customers, but behind the scenes, there's a lot of complexity. Makes you appreciate those buy now buttons even more. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about people buying everything from electronics to concert tickets. Mm. But how do you actually get them to your site in the first place? Ah, now we're getting into the marketing side of things. The white paper spends a good chunk of time on that, right? Hmm. Talk about email marketing and SEO and all that. It does. And it's interesting to see how even back then they were emphasizing the importance of those strategies. I have to admit, when I think about email marketing, I kind of think, is that still a thing? You know, with social media and everything else? It's definitely still relevant. The white paper even talks about the best days of the week to send out those marketing emails. Really? I would have thought Mondays would be the best time to catch people's attention. Actually, they recommend Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Oh, interesting. Why is that? Mondays, everyone's still catching up from the weekend. Their inboxes are overflowing. And by Thursday and Friday, people are already checked out thinking about the weekend. That makes sense. So timing is key. Yep. What about SEO? I remember back in the day, it was all about cramming keywords into your website. Well, it's a bit more nuanced than that. The white paper talks about the importance of something called long tail keywords. Long tail keywords. What are those? 
basically they're longer more specific phrases that people search for online instead of just targeting a general term like mobile phones you'd want to go after something more specific so instead of just mobile phones it'd be like buy nokia 6600 or something exactly the white paper actually uses that example they say a mobile phone store is going to have much better luck targeting those niche keywords makes sense you're going after people who are already further along in the buying process. Precisely. And you're facing less competition from other websites. So it's a win-win. Okay, last but not least, the white paper talks about the importance of customer service and having a smooth logistics operation. <laughs> it's easy to overlook those things when you're focused on building a website and getting people to click on your ads. But it's crucial. Because if your website is great, but then the product never arrives or the customer has a terrible time returning something that's gonna kill your business. For sure. And the white paper goes into detail about things like consumer rights regarding returns and refunds. They really emphasize that businesses need to be prepared to handle those situations gracefully. Because in Spain, those consumer rights are really strong, right? Exactly. And they were still being developed back in 2008, which is something the white paper brings up. Oh, really? What do you mean? Well, they mentioned that the legal framework for e-commerce was still evolving back then. So it was kind of like the Wild West of online business back then. In a way, yeah. Businesses were figuring things out as they went along. But that lack of clear legal guidelines could actually make it harder for people to trust online businesses. Because if you're not sure about your rights as a consumer, you're going to be less likely to take the risk of buying something online. Exactly. And it's not just about protecting consumers either. It's about creating a level playing field for businesses and fostering trust in the entire e-commerce ecosystem. Which ultimately benefits everyone. Right, absolutely. So when the white paper mentions that Spanish e-commerce laws were still in development back then, it really makes you think about how far things have come. And how those legal changes have shaped the market we see today. Exactly. It's like we've been digging into this time capsule from 2008, and it's given us this whole new perspective on the Spanish e-commerce landscape. It's amazing how much insight you can gain from looking back at where things started. For sure. It helps you appreciate how far we've come, but also understand the challenges that still lie ahead. And speaking of challenges, I think this white paper has given our listeners a lot to think about. Definitely. We've covered a ton of ground from the impact of government policies to the importance of building trust with consumers to the ever-evolving legal landscape. It's been quite a journey. It has. And the best part is this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to explore when it comes to Spanish e-commerce. So to our listeners, if you're feeling inspired to learn more, don't stop here. Keep digging, keep asking questions, and keep those online businesses thriving. And who knows, maybe your next great business idea is just around the corner. On that note, we'll wrap things up here. A huge thank you to AECM for the insightful white paper and to you, our incredible listeners, for joining us on this deep dive into the world of Spanish e-commerce. Until next time, stay curious.